Wayfair uh, about 12 years. I run the data science and business intelligence teams. Um, we've got some great support here. I see some of our data scientists up near the front row. Thanks, guys, for coming. Um, so very briefly, before I get into the details of the talk, I do want to take a quick second to uh, briefly explain what Wayfair is. Uh, I'm sure there are a lot of people in here who actually haven't heard of us before. So Wayfair is a tech company that just happens to play in the home furnishing space. Um, you know, uh, hopefully you've at least seen our commercials. The jingles are very catchy. Uh, they're definitely earworms. So if you haven't, you'll see them soon. Um, and then this is about as simply as I, as I can explain our mission. So we want to empower everyone, um, regardless of income level, um, to achieve a home that they love. Um, and I'll focus specifically on visual search as a case study. Um, but there are a lot of other efforts going on in the data science space at Wayfair, and feel free to ask me about them later. I'm happy to chat about them. So uh, what we're going to do is focus on the evolution of search uh, and how that brings us to visual search. So over the last 30 years, I think we've seen a pretty big explosion um, of advances in ways to find the products that you're looking for, uh, obviously owing very heavily to the advancement of technology itself. Um, so like I said, we'll focus on disruption in Wayfair space, but let's first talk real quickly about how we got there. Um, D chose to start his talk in 2017. I'm going to start my talk in 1895. Um, I, I think it's important to recognize that the catalog actually was a pretty big innovation at the time. Um, you know, it essentially brought the store to you. Um, you can see I have a time to value scale that we'll be following over the other disruptions. Um, I'm not making the argument that catalog is AI by any means. Um, but it absolutely can bring the store to you and really opened up selection for a pretty big part of the country. Um, it was not at all my intention to select companies that are no longer doing business. Uh, that was sort of an accident. Um, there is a company up here that's still in operation. So East Bay was actually acquired by Woolworths and is now doing business under the name Foot Locker. So they're not all gone. Um, now let's get into the AI side. Uh, so these are great screen grabs from almost 20 years ago. Uh, you can see product design has come a long way as well. Um, but you know, let's talk about digital search. So you, know, you think about Amazon, you think about eBay, even 20 years ago, uh, the catalogs are far too massive for your traditional um, sort of print catalog approach. Um, and so both independently developed artificially intelligent search systems, uh, which made finding the products um, in these massive catalogs keyword easy. Uh, so you can see we're continuing to move along the time to value scale. Things are getting a little easier for the consumer. We're finding things faster. Um, so let's keep moving down that scale. Um, you know, taking the, the search technology to the next step, uh, we have you know, in a, internet aggregators. We've used Google here. Um, you know, they use search technology to consolidate the Wayfair feed, the Amazon feed, uh, and everyone else who's willing to provide that product feed to Google. Uh, which is a big leap forward for the consumer, you know, especially when you think about commoditized spaces. I've used Keurig here, um, you know, any number of a thousand examples where you know, there's 30, 40, 50 retailers uh, trying to sell you the same thing. How do I make sense of all of this? Um, and this search ag aggregation is actually a really great way to do that. Um, Google Shopping used to be called Frugal. Uh, the link is still active if you want to check it out. Uh, it used to be free for advertisers. Uh, it was kind of a bummer when they started making us pay for it and making everyone else pay for it. But the value is absolutely there, uh, an absolutely great example of AI disruption. Uh, continuing to move along the time to value scale, uh, we're getting deeper into AI, you know, getting into personalization and recommender systems. Um, you know, technology essentially becomes your personal shopper uh, in examples like these. Um, I've used Stitch Fix. Um, I know they have an IPO coming, which is very exciting for them. Um, but essentially, we can take um, all of your data, you know, whether it's explicit data, whether you're actually telling me, I love this thing, or whether it's implicit data. You know, we can take your clicks. We can take your Pinterest saves. We can take your views. Uh, and we can translate all of that um, into helping you find what you're looking for. I know at Wayfair, we tend to hop back and forth between the term search and the term find, because um, really what we're all about is product discovery. How do we help you get to the product you're after as quickly and as seamlessly as possible? Um, and again, we mostly use actually implicit signals today, um, but recommendation systems, again, another great disruption for, for e-commerce, just helping the customer find what they need even faster. Um, and then a big leap forward on the time to value scale 
um, new instruments of search. So we've chosen the voice activated devices, Amazon Alexa, Google Home, um, and, and this has really upended at least the way we shop. Uh, if you think about a voice assistant that's capable of crawling you know, the massive Amazon catalog, it makes things like reordering a consumable, something like <laughs> laundry detergent if you don't have a dash button or olive oil or something like that, um, or making an impulse purchase um, that much easier, that much faster. Uh, and what's really incredible about these is it's enabled us to do that while taking us away from what we, con we traditionally consider our shopping devices. So you don't have to be at a laptop, you don't have to be on your tablet, you don't have to be on your phone, and you can still just shout across the room and say, hey Alexa, I'm out of Lay's potato chips, you know, let's, let's get that refilled. Um, so what's really interesting also about uh, voice search is it actually leaves itself open to disruption. I don't know how many folks here have heard of the um, Google Home of the Whopper campaign that Burger King put forward. So um, Burger King actually released a TV commercial that could activate your Google Home uh, and got Google to start t reading you the Wikipedia entry for the Whopper. Um, you know, Google figured it out, they put a stop to it. <coughs> Burger King released a new ad that did the same thing. So um, interestingly enough, you know, as you're disrupting at light speed, you do leave yourself open for disruption in and of itself, um, which is very cool. Uh, I urge you to check it out. It's a really neat, a really clever campaign from Burger King. Um, and then we'll get into visual search. Um, so I think one of the big things that I want to point out uh, for the rest of the Wayfair slides that we go through is our ability to quickly translate ideas for customer experience and the supporting algorithms to features in production is really pretty key for our ability to disrupt in the AI space in general. Um, so for style-oriented verticals like home decor, um, you know, visual search, visual shopping uh, has a real opportunity to disrupt. You know, if you think about search in general, it's really easy to hop onto a site and say, I need a four pack of Duracell AA batteries. You're gonna find what you need. Um, but what if I were to say, help me find that really great industrial metal bar stool with a square top and cross support legs. Um, try to type that into Google uh, and see what you get. Um, I think visual search uh, really helps uh, helps again increase the time to value. You can see I've actually left some time on the right um, of the time value scale for a couple reasons. First, um, I'm not so arrogant to think that there won't be further disruption that continues to move us further along that path. Um, and then second, in e-commerce, I don't think we should forget about logistics. Um, we're always gonna need to bring the product to the customer, so there's always gonna be a sunk cost of transporting the physical good from A to B. So let's get into visual search, how did we do it? Um, visual search was actually a hackathon project at Wayfair, um, which is very neat. So we took uh, four incredibly engaged data scientists and engineers, and they spent the weekend building a prototype. Uh, the prototype was called DecorNet. You actually have real shots from DecorNet that was built in two days. Um, your initial results you can see weren't great. On the far left you have the user input, so we took a snap of a tufted couch. Um, and we got back actually some tufted couches, pretty good. Um, we also got a chair in there, not great. Um, but this is two days worth of work. So I think the big takeaways <laughs> from the hackathon project were really one, create space for your all-stars to innovate. Um, like we said, we gave a really passionate team, you know, a weekend, free compute resources, and this is what they came up with, it was amazing. Um, and then I think number two is build the MVP end to end. Prove your viability. Uh, if you're trying to make a case that this should be done, uh, it helps to show the user what it's gonna look like. Um, this actually won the hackathon, um, and our judges are essentially all of our C-suite, uh, and they were really blown away because they could take it from search to result and really see how this would impact our product. Um, and then the other thing that's really neat to mention is Wayfair Next, which is Wayfair's 3D and augmented reality program, was also a hackathon project. Uh, so again, this model really works and you can do some really incredible things with a small amount of people in a pretty short amount of time. So what do we do once we think it's gonna work? Uh, we put a team around it. So what you have here is actually the team as it stands today, working on visual search. 
So we obviously have product managers, right? They're quarterbacking the team. They're providing the overall vision. And they're keeping us on task, right? They're excellent project managers, and they're keeping us moving. Um, we have data scientists. We have search technologists. We have business intelligence analysts. Um, so what are we doing there? We're obviously developing the underlying deep learning models. Um, we're working very closely with the next group, the storefront engineers, uh, to put the product into production. And then we're also focusing on algorithm SLAs, right? When we're talking about search, you don't have five seconds, you don't have 10 seconds, you have 100 milliseconds, you have 200 milliseconds to get this um, search executed. So we need to keep that in mind as we're developing the algorithms. Um, we have storefront engineers. They're connecting the algorithm to our users on site. Uh, and they're actually deploying and maintaining the visual search model. Uh, and then we have creative, right? You know, we couldn't design the experience with our creative and UI UX folks. So they work with product, they work with us to understand what we're really trying to do for the customer. Uh, and then they develop the user experience uh, and the associated on-site creative. So you can see all told, you know, we have about 12 to 13 people working on this. Um, and it's been going pretty well. Uh, the next slide I think a lot of you will like. This is as nuts and bolts as I'm going to get today. Um, so this is basically a diagram of what we've put together. So on the technical level, our investment was one, establishing the appropriate modeling pipeline, uh, and then two, actually physically acquiring GPU resources to make this all work. Um, Wayfair is not in the cloud, uh, so we do have on-prem uh, data centers. So the actual hardware was a very important part of this whole process. So just working quickly from left to right, you know, we have our file name uh, pairs with labels. Um, I think that's one of the things that makes us so successful. Uh, anyone in this room will probably tell you, you know, an amazing data scientist with a teeny tiny amount of data is not going to beat an okay data scientist with an exceptional amount of data. Uh, I think that Wayfair probably has one of the best, if not the best labeled training sets of furniture data. And I think that's what's made us successful. So on the far left, you have that training set, um, the training data. It's labeled pairs of images, essentially saying you're a match or you're not a match. Um, so we have workers pre-processing the image files, turning them into NumPy arrays. Uh, and then we push those into a shared queue where the training system can actually grab those, um, grab those images on a separate set of threads. Um, and you can see we have compute decoupled from storage, so we can continue writing back, um, you know, model checkpoints, uh, training statistics, uh, training loss, validation loss. Um, and that's really important, I think, for two main reasons. Uh, one, if this thing crashes, we don't have to start from zero. We don't have to retrain the model. And then I think, two, um, we can jump out, we can you know, implement early stopping at any point. If we start to see overfit happening, um, you know, that's obviously a challenge as well. And for those of you, I actually will get a little deeper into some details here on how we actually are doing this thing. So the learning algorithm itself um, is stochastic gradient descent. Um, and we're actually using Inception V3, which is a convolutional neural network from Google. Um, our learning rate schedule is linear. Um, and we're using transfer learning. So we actually took Inception V3 that was trained on ImageNet. And then we applied transfer learning on our own data set to uh, slowly transition uh, this model to our task. And then for tools at a very high level, um, we're using TensorFlow with Keras. Um, Keras allows us to move a little bit faster. Um, and then finally, on the hardware side, we're using the latest and greatest in GPUs. So we're on NVIDIA Tesla P100 GPUs, which is the latest and greatest for now. I know Volta is coming soon. Um, but we do have some uh, pretty serious horsepower uh, behind this thing. <coughs> and so how's it doing? Um, so there's really two primary KPIs when you think about the performance of visual search. Um, there's how's the model doing empirically, and then how are the customers responding to it, right? You can't have one without the other. If you have the best model in the world, but customers don't love it, that doesn't really, that's not going to get you anywhere. So on the left, um, our primary success metric for the model, we use recall at K, which basically means of the set K, did I return the image, the exact match of the image that I'm looking for? So we have a validation set that the neural network never sees, uh, and that's what we're feeding in to establish our recall numbers. Um, and you can see we've been able to make pretty good step function improvements from uh, the ImageNet baseline through our first training set you know, to our next uh, big set of architectural changes. Um, and then on the right, we have the product side KPIs. 
you know, what are people that are doing? What are people that what are people doing that are using this feature? You know, how are they reacting? How are they responding? Um, you can see we've used a pretty high level KPI. This is just seven day um, return rate after you've used, you've used Visual Search. The inflection point in the middle is actually when we rolled out V2 of the model, that blue line. Um, you know, I think a lot of folks are going to ask, you know, big deal, why are you using uh, seven day visit rate? Um, it's still a new feature. I think one of the biggest things we're really pushing now is customer adoption. We know it's great. A lot of people don't even know it's out there. A lot of people don't even know that Amazon has a visual search feature. So uh, customer adoption is very big. And as we get more and more data into the system, we'll move away from something like a repeat visit rate to a more lower level KPI, something like you know, add to cart or purchase or something like that. And then uh, I know that the title of the talk was both the present and the promise. So this is the promise aspect of it. What's been really amazing is that this hackathon project of visual search has spawned a huge number of threads uh, after we've demonstrated the success of what this thing can really do. So I've got a few examples here. There's actually more than this that we're going into, but things like implicit product recommendations, you know, that's generating recommendations for you based on what your clicking looks like. Instead of using something like a collaborative filter, we're actually using the images to gem generate products that have similar styles. And I'll show you a slide on that. Um, merchandising, you know, how do we find duplicate products in the catalog? It's a terrible customer experience when you see five of the same thing um, right in your face on the page. Um, so we've been able to apply uh, our visual embeddings to that problem. Um, you know, being able to identify uh, all furniture within a room all at once is actually my favorite one. It's the last slide. Uh, I'll show you that at the end. Um, and then marketing, you know, getting into how do you predict whether a customer is going to react favorably to an image at all? Um, it's a really big deal for the creative that you're putting out there in front of the customers. Um, and so we're starting to get into modeling the quality of an image itself uh, to see if customers are going to react to it. So real quick, I'll go into some great examples here. Um, I mentioned visual recommendations. Um, this is a very quick how we're doing it. So the browse context is what the customer is actually looking at. You know, what are they clicking on? We feed that into our visual, visual embedding space. And we essentially find the products which are closest uh, to those products that are being clicked on. You can see anecdotally, it actually looks pretty good. Uh, the styles are consistent. Um, and we're able to do this cross class, uh, which is something that collaborative filtering and other recommendation systems have actually struggled with using, um, for example, dresser data to recommend a bar stool. Um, we haven't seen collaborative filters be successful there, but our visual embeddings, uh, you can see anecdotally, look a lot better. Um, interesting finds. Uh, I'll give Sunanda a shout out. This is uh, one, of her big, one of her big things. Uh, I, I personally love this effort because what we're doing is we're establishing a space. Uh, the example here is coffee. Um, and we're saying, great, find me things that are within this space but are visually different from one another. And you can see that really coming through in the interesting finds results page. Uh, it's a pretty compelling page. It draws your eyes to it. And so we're grabbing things. We're essentially grabbing the purple dots on the outer ring of the space, knowing that they're reasonably far apart in the visually embedded space, but they are in the same, um, in the same theme. Uh, and then, like I mentioned, my absolute favorite, um, identifying all the products in a room um, so that you can shop them. So Wayfair works with thousands upon thousands of interior designers, interior decorators, uh, and they submit amazing photos like these to us. Um, being able to go through the exercise of making this image live and shoppable in a matter of seconds instead of a matter of days or weeks, you know, using offshore resources and offshore tagging um, is really exciting. Uh, and I think really compelling, again, from this home decor space where it's all about visual inspiration, visual shopping. Um, you know, I personally would find it a lot easier to shop something like this rather than you know, a, a grid of sofas and trying to find what I really like. Um, instead, you can start with a scene. Um, you know, find a scene you really like, and then pick and choose from there you know, what's really interesting about that scene. So that's all I brought with me. Um, I will also say that we are hiring. We are always hiring. Um, please feel free to find me, uh, find our booth out there. Uh, actually play with visual search. We have it set up live in the booth. Um, yeah, it, it can be fun to also take a selfie with visual search and see what piece of furniture you most resemble. Um, <laughs> our recruiter, Michelle, tried this uh, right before we got started. Her second result was a picture of Jesus, which was very interesting. Um, but thanks for listening, folks. <laughs>